we're uh, coming up. Oh, yeah, there we go. Keeping the legacy alive. Right? That is an interesting topic because up until now, cannabis has been one of the uh, biggest success stories of, like, decentralization. You know? And now, capitalism trying to capitalize. They want to centralize everything. It's an interesting thing. We're going to talk about it. And to lead this panel, the founder and CEO of Green Rush Consulting. Let's hear it for Zeta Seti. Let's hear it for Zeta Seti. Let's hear it for Zeta Seti. BC, actually. What's up, guys? How are you guys doing out there? Yeah. How's everybody doing? Great. My name is Zeta Seti. I'm CEO and founder of Green Rush Consulting. Um, and we're here to talk about culture of cannabis, keeping the legacy alive in corporate cannabis. I've got four panelists up here today, very special people. On the far end down here, we have Aaron Smith. He's the co-founder and executive director of National Cannabis Industry Association. Aaron has successfully built coalitions with elected officials on both sides of the aisle in order to advance cannabis policy reform, legislation in the state capitol, and among the public. Please welcome Aaron. Next up, we have Lena Staller, Vice President of Business Development. I aspire a cannabis or a company focused on high-end consumer vaping technology. Lena earned her place as a thought leader in the California cannabis industry by helping to shape the retail landscape, driving sell-through in main, both mainstream and niche markets. As women grow chairwoman, she hosted networking events with world-class brands and was a founding member at the first two events in California Music Festival history, legally vending cannabis at Northern Lights and Grasslands. She also helped work on social equity in Oakland and decriminalized entheogens and plant-based psychedelics. Everybody welcome Luna. <laughs> Next up, we got Needy Lucky Honda. Lucky, huh? We're so lucky to have her today, today guys. It's awesome. Needy is the founder and CEO of Rude, a California lifestyle brand forged on the principle of radicalizing the common narrative surrounding cannabis culture with a focus on propelling a multitude of topics like inclusivity, restorative justice, and cannabis industry etiquette. Welcome, Needy. Yeah. And finally, we have Lisa Hogg. Lisa Hogg is the founder of MJ Universe, a publisher of digital products and a collaborative network to connect companies along the value chain of hemp and cannabis. Lisa is also a founding member and on the board of the BVCWEV and a member of the Cannafirm Network, a professional network for women, hemp, and cannabis in Germany. Everybody give it up for her. Awesome, awesome. Thank you guys so much. Okay, so here we go, ready? A little bit of history though, okay, of cannabis culture, brief overview. Um, you know, obviously cannabis is amazing these days, but you know, started with really, I believe so the Jamaican Rastafarian culture back in the 1850s and 1860s, really kind of bringing it to the fold, and then moving into the California counterculture in the 60s, to then under Prop 215 from medical, and then Denver, Washington going full legalization, we're seeing legalization all over the place now internationally, Eight 18 legal states and 37 medical states in the United States, and now an international marketplace potentially worth $146 billion by 2025. Pretty amazing. So we're going to start with some of our first questions. Uh, you know, please tell our audience what each of your businesses are seeing out there today in terms of how the legacy market is being impacted as legalization is becoming mainstream. Aaron, you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, thanks, Ada. And thanks, ICBC and all of you for being here. It's great to um, learn from what's happening here across the pond and uh, share ideas with all of these great folks up here. So thank you. Thank you all. Um, I really, you know, have been watching the industry uh, really from a very U.S.-centered, you know, focus as leading the U.S. Trade Association. So I'm not going to speak for Europe, but what we see is that, you know, as we've, we have done a really great job at moving public opinion in the right direction, away from prohibition, you know, switching state laws over and over and over. We have 37 states with medical, 18 with adult use. Um, but, you know, the good, the good side of that is that means less, there are less arrests, but on, this, on the flip side, uh, we have not done enough to create regulatory regimes 
regimes that are accessible to uh, minority-owned businesses, um, other you know small mom-and-pop operators uh, who who uh, were at one time legacy operators, meaning they were operating in the previously unregulated market. Um, and so we need to be doing a lot more, both at the federal, state, and local level uh, in in the U.S. to open up these markets to everybody. Julio, what do you think about that in terms of impact, the you know, legacy market being impacted by legalization? I was born and raised in Northern California. I was in middle school in 1996 when Prop 215 was passed, so cannabis was everywhere. I never considered it a drug, so for me, my entire community and my perspective is that it's medicine. I've been a patient since you could be a patient. Um, I've been selling it, smoking it, and growing it my entire life. It put me through grad school, and it's brought me where I am today, so to see the extinction event happen to a lot of the legacy farmers that weren't considered during the regulatory process and were left out, um, as Aaron's mentioning it's when I use the word extinction event I mean that in the literal economic term and there's been multiple of them so I would say maybe 90% of the people that we used to work with before it was made legal a few years ago are no longer in business for various reasons of course everyone knows that capitalism is in a lot of ways a game of greed if it's not conscious capitalism it's kind of got a predatory perspective and unfortunately with capital you have more more play in this space and so a lot of our job is to make sure that these things are not lost and we stay grounded in our roots, whether it's, as Frenchie Cannoli says, the terroir of the place. So in Northern California, we have a very special Mediterranean type climate that grows a specific kind of cannabis with certain cannabinoids and terpenes and profile that is really rich and it's, you know, we were proud of that heritage. And so to lose that from just making something that's a magical, mystical, medicinal plant and do a typical consumer packaged goods, there's something lost there and we're here to really just remind that there has to be some purpose and um, respect for this plant and the plant medicine and everything we do and not just treat it like it's another consumer good because it's really not. It needs to be treated in a special way or else we're going to destroy it. Yeah, right on. And so, like, you know, that's really, really important, you know, because the fact of the matter is it, it comes from the culture. You know, this is the folks that built this industry, right? So having to be able to resonate with that is super, super important in the way she's talking about. I mean, wouldn't you agree, Needy? I mean, tell us a little bit about what you think. Absolutely. I, I run a brand uh, based in California. So like Luna, you know, my perspective is very California centric. And, you know, we're watching the cultivators, Loon supports craft cultivators. We really make it make not just a concerted effort, but it's part of our ethos to buy flour from small farmers. They are getting pummeled right now as we're seeing, you know, the big corporate grows come online. The economy of growing is upside down in California. It costs $700 a pound to grow and cultivate, the market's at 300. So, you know, in 2022, we're hearing about farmers killing themselves every day in California. It is an extremely volatile moment, and you know, there's a lot that the newer markets can learn from this. There's, it's, it's, it's really unbelievable because you know, the thing to really focus on for all of us here interested in this business is the best behaved part of the supply chain is the consumer. A lot of the problems we have in this industry are man-made. We can control and do things differently. So, you know, I would say that's that's the big thing that we're seeing at Loon. Right on. And you know, I'm very, very well familiar with the California market, but learning from the California market is very, very important. When we take it all the way across the world over to a place like Germany, Lisa, give us your thoughts on some of that. Uh, well, I think in general it is very important that we learn from each other and that we um, trying not to only create these local markets. I mean, if you look at Europe, for example, there are individual zones, like you know, from the states. And um, I think in the end, it should all be uh, that we are more connected and that we are lobbying also for changes in global drug policy, that we can create a global cannabis industry where it is not only like individual markets, where you then see these effects, like these price drops, way more um, than, uh, than if you have a harmonized system where you can uh, where you can yeah trade and you can exchange products and it, they're not only stuck in their local markets but I think it's very important with the countries that are a little bit further ahead that we learn from them that we as entrepreneurs uh, exchange and um, yeah just learn from the mistakes also that happened in other more further developed uh, areas 
Yes, and these folks, I mean, you understand, they've been traumatized in a way. Multi-generational farmers who have known just this is the way they need to operate. And education is so important to help bridge the gap and create that conduit between your business and the consumer, right? And so I'd like to actually roll that into this next question, which is, you know, since each of you guys, you know, someone have a little bit different of businesses, um, how, are you, how are you guys, you know, tell our audience actually how your business in general is currently connecting with consumers at that level that resonates with industry culture. You want to go, uh, Luna, you want to try it out? Well, we do dope hardware. We lean hard into the concept that this is um, a, a beautiful, high-end luxury lifestyle. It's not just for losers and stoners and lazy people. We have dab rigs that are induction heating that are really high-end technology, but still are a nod to the old-school dab culture. If you don't know what dabbing is, it's high-temperature vaporization through something like a bong, but it's specifically for concentrated THC or any concentrated cannabinoid, really. Um, for Usually for people who have a really high tolerance and they want a lot of THC or they want to have a custom experience. So for us, we're able to have you know, bring technology and innovation into a space that really hasn't had much innovation. People are still using the same pipes and joints that they've been using for, you know, 40 to 100 years, however, you know, apples or whatever you find. So for us, we're really trying to be sophisticated and polished and show the, the, the cannabis consumer and to normalize it culturally um, and also to investors or to people who are on the fence about it to legitimize it as this business, but also not leave people behind. Or There's a lot of brands that will brand themselves like as anti-stoner and they put that down to define themselves. We're not about that. We, we like I wear, you know, everyone on our iSpire team, if anyone came by our booth, you'll see we wear plug necklaces. In, in California, the plug means you're the connect, you hook people up, you're the yenta, you're the matchmaker, you, you want to you wanna get people what they need. And it's actually a form of like love and respect and flow and you're the hook. And so we, 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 we wear that to show that whatever you need, we got you on that. Whether it's policy, whether it's parties, whether it's culture, whether it's dab rigs, vape pens, it doesn't really matter where you're at, it's, if, if, if you're, you know, contributing to the normalization of this plant, that's what we're all about. We have, you know, we always focus on hiring women, people of color, trying to incorporate as many folks as we can. Um, when we partner with people, we give preferential um, attention and support to people that have marginalized backgrounds, queer folks, people who are giving back to nonprofits. So we do a lot of corporate social responsibility work. We do uh, beach cleanups, and we give back where we can because if you're not giving, you really shouldn't be in this space. It's the plant is giving in its nature. Great, that's awesome. And then I would love to actually jump to you, Lisa, with MJ Universe, uh, which is a platform that's providing access to experts. And again, education is key here, right? So tell us, Lisa, how, how, are, you, how are you guys bridging that gap? Well, um, for us, it's all about um, yeah, explaining cannabis to mainstream businesses also. A lot of my clients, for example, are pharmaceutical companies. They don't know anything about cannabis, so you really start from scratch about explaining what the plant does, about the contents, and bringing across um, this potential of cannabis to conventional industries that exist. But like, if you talk about the stoner stereotype, for example, I think this is often also abused um, in certain ways because uh, we, for example, in Germany, we just had a raid in a supermarket. They had a promotion for hemp products, but it was all labeled as hash brownies and all these kind of things. It had little Rasta people on it, which is like really like, I don't know, <laughs> not acceptable exactly. And um, in the end, uh, it was all about hemp products and they didn't make use of this vast potential that is in the hemp nutrition that they could have used easily, but they decided to take the stoner stereotype, make it uh, red, yellow, green, and then put a Rasta man on it which is really a lot of cultural appropriation also. That's, yeah, that raid was unfortunate. <laughs> um, so Nidhi, tell us a little bit about how your products are connecting with consumers, or your business in general is connecting with consumers in the California market. How's it going? Yeah, this is everything that we think about every day at Loon as a brand that is really focused and committed to building out a new narrative, telling new stories about the 3.0 consumer. What is possible for our industry? I think we all understand that there is a lot of potential here, which is why we're all here. Uh, but 
creating that bridge, telling the stories, both the social justice reform stories in a palatable way to a consumer. We put out a quarterly magazine at Loon called Honestly Grown. It marries lifestyle, so there might be a feature about how to style your weed cart instead of having a bar cart, and then also tells a story about social justice reform and how we can action actionably get people out of prison for sell you know serving these non-violent cannabis crimes. This is something that every single one of us should be very not just passionate about, but feel as a moral imperative is part of our work. And at Loon, we take that as part of our mission. So it's it really you see it in the packaging is recyclable, you know, the little details that really like feed into, we know a lot about cannabis consumers, they care about Mother Earth, they care about conscious consumerism, how that outlays and how we market and message I think is so important. So Absolutely. it's part of everything really in the brand ethos. And that bridges the culture. I mean, it's really getting people to feel comfortable. I love that, palliative stories. That's just awesome. Palliative stories around your brand, right? And then also focusing on a lot of the issues and challenges. And Aaron, I'm sure you can give us a little bit about that with NCIA in terms of a lot of the issues and challenges in terms of restorative justice and how that works. Can you do a little better? Yeah, thanks. Well, you know, we put this in perspective. Um, I, this, you know, we've been facing nearly 100 years of marijuana prohibition at the federal level in the United States. That prohibition policy was put in place to subjugate people uh, blatantly. Um, and, and let's face it, it's not people that look like me. It's, it's to subjugate black and brown communities. And we absolutely, as we move away from prohibition, we're still in prohibition, but as we move away from it, we absolutely must ensure that the industry does everything it can to try to repair the harm associated with, with the previous policies. And NCI is always there edu educating entrants into the industry because we're, we are the first place that many people go when they're, they're coming into to try to find their place in cannabis and making sure they understand that you know what that history is and what our new role is and this this is a once in a lifetime experience that we're or once in a lifetime opportunity that we are all engaging in here and creating a brand new industry um, and an industry that uh, we could just you know cede it to big tobacco big pharma big alcohol um, but no we're making sure that we stick to the values that are you know taught to us you know through the legacy of the cannabis plant uh, and the, and the previous industry and that's a big part of us. Uh, NCIA is being kind of part of the bully pulpit, so to speak. Um, on the policy side, there's a lot going on at the state and, and national level. Kind of focus on national. Um, you know, I look at what the work we do is really kind of bifurcated into two tracks: um, you know, lobbying Congress and the administration to pass the kind of po ultimate perfect marijuana bill that's going to, um, you know, that that will have all of the, you know, all the bells and whistles that we all want to see in a in a land where marijuana is legal coast to coast, um, and then also what we can get done like today or in the, you know, in the near future, what's politically um, possible. Um, on the more comprehensive legislation side, there are something like seven cannabis bills in Congress. We support all of them to some degree. Um, we're really excited about a new bill coming out, though, from, that kind of brings elements from all of them from Senator, uh, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. Uh, should be out by the... Uh, before the election, um, which we're really focusing on lobbying him and his office to understand the need to include restorative justice measures in that in that legislation to ensure that there, if there's a federal licensing system, which will be proposed, that that we don't have arbitrary caps on those licenses, that the barrier to entry, capital requirements, etc., are at a point to where you know not just anyone can get a license, but Anyone with a you know reasonable acumen can can get a license at the federally, um, and then leave a lot to the states. We want to leave as much as possible to states because the states have been the laboratories of democracy all along. Um, on the kind of what's more practically likely to happen in the next couple of years, I think the biggest, most important um, policy objective we're working on is this is is a piece of legislation in the U.S. called the Safe Banking Act, uh, which would allow U.S. banks to do business with cannabis operators uh, and licensees without fear of you know getting their you know getting shut down by the feds, um, and also would allow the cannabis industry to access financial services without being gouged. Uh, many 
many of them are being gouged with exorbitant fees just to deposit their, you know, just to deposit their cash at the end of the night. Not to mention they don't have access to lending and traditional lending and financial services. This bill would allow, would open up the, open up those opportunities, which are really mostly needed by the smaller operators. The big multi-state operators have, they have private sources of capital um, and are not as dependent on uh, the things like the Small Business Administration and other uh, mechanisms that we have for small business in the U.S. Awesome. Hey, guys, can we give another round of applause for NCIA doing this type of work for us? I mean, come on. This is awesome. This really paves the way for new entrepreneurs to get into this space, you know, and provide something called legal amnesty. Like, let's just say you're here now in Spain and you're, you're, you're doing stuff underground. This type of work really helps us pave the way for the rest of the world. So really thank you guys so much for, for, for doing that. Um, and moving, and see, speaking of legal amnesty, um, you know, in new markets, it's critical to support these folks because we're seeing this happen in states like New York. Um, you know, it happened in California. They've created measures or, or ways of, of supporting these folks and bridging them from the unregulated market to the, to the regulated market. You know, also bridging the gap between culture and corporate here, um, you know, and, and multi-generational farmers, you name it, right? And I'm just kind of wondering, you know, um, if, with each of you guys' as businesses, like what, do you, what is your business doing to support these folks? You have been targeted by the war on drugs, let's say, um, you know, to create opportunities to work with them in these new types of markets. Linda, do you want to uh, give us an idea what iSpire is doing in that space right now with all the work that you've done? So yeah, we uh, actually just ran a holiday gift that we donated in, instead of you know spending a bunch of money to send something, we sent a custom, we make a wand, which is a torch replacement. We had them custom painted by our friend JV Artie, he's a well-known artist in the United States. And um, we made a, a, a sizable donation per gift that we gave away in that person's name to the Social Impact Center, um, which is founded by two women of color in San Diego. And um, they are working on uh, basically the drug war, so people who've been um, in disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. So usually people of color, people that live in highly policed areas, um, and really working on initiatives to make sure that they um, are able to vote afterwards and they can participate in democracy, that they can get good jobs, that they're able to move forward in their lives. And um, yeah, really, the, the most important thing for us is that pe is, is autonomy, sovereignty, and everyone being able to do exactly what they need to do for themselves. So there's people that we work with. Um, one of our partners is Exhibit. He's a well-known rapper. Um, he started a company called Napalm. Um, he is, you know, a, an African-American guy who, you know, was famous for selling weed and rapping about strippers and doing this stuff. And he's been able to, to uh, raise a cannabis company in a state that's traditionally locks people up with people that look like him, that he would be locked up for doing that if he didn't have, you know, the proper lawyers and the proper capital. But we, we're seeing people rising up from situations where they used to go to jail for selling weed to being someone that a young person of color can look up to. So we uh, fill their hardware. We offer them their cartridges. If you go into California and you buy one of Exhibit's uh, Napalm's cartridges or um, one of, you know, we have a custom battery for them, we're able to, like, uplift different people in our spaces, women-owned businesses. I work with a lot of women-owned businesses, too, that we're able to do extra promotions for them, give them extra love on social. We're able to um, really make sure that when they're going through their processes that we can be a true partner to them and show up with, for them with intentionality instead of just using them to check boxes off of our list. Um, we actually have Jessica Redenbow, our marketing director right here in the audience. Um, she's also a woman of color and an amazing advocate and activist who's been in the regulated market and uh, pre-regulated market. So she runs our, you know, our brand and our events and um, she very much puts herself into that. So like having women and people of color and marginalized people at the center of the decision making is different than just hiring a couple people to work the front. We need to have them in position positions of leadership and in positions of management and in positions of ownership as well and stop. A lot of companies will do these things where it's all about optics and PR. They just want things to look good so they'll check boxes obligatorily and it's just, it feels very perfunctory. It doesn't feel authentic and genuine. We need people to actually step up and really be sharing. You know, we were talking earlier, I, I know in Germany, um, Lisa was saying that it's, it's people are, you know, there's a brain drain. People are leaving their industry because they're not making enough money. The rich people are not sharing with the workers 
and so we have all these brilliant people who know how to grow, who know how to do these things that are leaving because it's an abusive environment. So making it a really safe space, connecting with women's groups. We do a ton of work in, in um, women's empowerment. Just going out of your way, make, cutting out time and cutting out budget to, to really overtly do this work with these people. That's awesome, and it really coalesces with their brand message, right? Because at the end of the day, it's going to be flowers, 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 flower. You know, it's really important to have this message and do this work for the communities um, and for all these different types of folks. And I imagine, you know, you guys are doing just as, just as good as well. Tell us a little bit about it. No, definitely, and you know, it's kudos to you guys at iSpire because you know I think that's all we all need to show up. And at Loon, we've been really dedicated to that from the jump. So when I first started the brand and literally had no money and was very eager to keep mission central to everything that we do, I went to Last Prisoner Project and said, "Hey, guys, I don't have any money, but I want to support you. What can we do? Can we? We have an amazing creative team. Can we create content? Can we start amplifying?" the message of what you're trying to do. We started there and today we have a skew on the menu all the time at Loon where 100% of the proceeds go to mission, like Last Prisoner Project. So, you know, I really think it's important that at every level in our industry, just show up, you know. Today, I think the most impactful work we're doing at Loon is with an accelerator called Momentum. It's a phenomenal program. It supports uh, underrepresented minorities and folks disproportionately affected by the war on, on drugs uh, by giving them $50,000 with no strings attached, no equity requirements, in, in their brands, helping them succeed, putting them through a 12-week program, teaching them things like, you know, how important compliance is. It's phenomenal to me as somebody who has a brand, how many founders I meet who don't have budgets for compliance. The best way we can help the legacy market bridge the gap is by really educating. And to Luna earlier, you know, mentioned we need to stop using this blanket term education. We need to flesh it out. Education on compliance and really understanding the market. It seems like there's a massive gap right now for folks. You know, if you're running a billion dollar company and you have an entire team of lawyers dedicated to compliance, those are not going to be the same friction points that if you're a small mom and pop trying to just put products on the shelf and you don't understand that the California Universal Triangle now has to be a quarter of an inch instead of half an inch that can screw up your entire business. So I think, you know, it's really, I'm very passionate about the work that Momentum is doing. I sit on the committee and as a brand, we also sponsor that initiative financially. Um, but in general, I think the message should be just show up. So if it is the beach cleanup, if it is showing up in whatever way, Put your value system first. I think we're in an industry where that's incredibly critical, more so than in any other emerging industry. There's obviously the money grab mentality that's dominating most of the conversations, but you know, I, I think mission and authenticity is something that will always shine through loudest and and proudest, and ultimately the consumer will choose, you know, brands that really and companies that really show that off. Awesome, awesome. And you know who's showing up for you guys over here in Europe is Lisa right here for Germany. Excellent. Give her a round of applause, man. She's doing a great job for Germany. Uh, women empowerment. Tell us a little bit about what's happening in Germany in that group. Yeah, well, Germany, it's very interesting what is happening at the moment because we have a little bit different background than you have in, in the States, for example, like compassionate use programs would not be possible for us, like there, it's a very different environment. We could not do recreational grow and then hand out medicine to people. It's two different systems in the end, but um, also something that you can see in the medical market is that is very important and it's also something that Ed Rosenthal, I don't know who of you saw his talk prior, he said there are the people who do the work and the people who got the money. So we need to make sure a little bit more that more money comes to the people who do the leg work and who are doing the groundwork in terms of patient education for the medical part, for example, which are patient associations and they are mostly um, self-funded or have small donations, but like we need to make sure that this big corporate money also goes down to the grassroots and helps 
grow the cannabis plant that we are planting at the moment and not that everything just stays in the top and uh, the people who have been in it for the long run and who have been working in this industry for 20 years plus that they cannot participate and are overrun by huge mainstream corporates. Right, and it's important as, as any business really, um, you know, having just the good hiring practices or good vendor selection that really encourages these folks to participate. Um, that can include, you know, training and empowerment programs or there's so many different things you can do in this industry, and that's why this industry is amazing, because there's a lot of opportunity. You just got to look at it at the right lens. And that's why it's important that, you know, all these women are just doing such a great job. We're all doing just such a great job, but we got to do it collectively together. And that's what we're doing here today at ICBC is sharing this information, sharing these strategies and solutions so that all of us can benefit from one each other, countries to country, state to state, person to person. I think it's absolutely amazing. Thank you guys so much for all the great work that you're doing. Um, yeah, round of applause for our guys. Let's do it again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to go for one more. La lastly, moving from a legacy market to a regulated market, what are four tips that legacy cannabis companies can do that you can tell our audience on how they can survive in a world of corporations coming in that have larger access to capital, refined systems, and scalability? Lisa. Go ahead. Uh, four tips for me. Um, <laughs> yes, what you got? Yeah. Well, uh, I think like uh, one very important thing is to collaborate and to make sure that uh, all this knowledge that has been built up over the last years is not lost somewhere, but it is transferred. And um, education, I think, is very important. Uh, everybody should focus more on that. And like really, um, it's part of our job. Um, but what I would also uh, would wish more for would be that. Uh, the companies understand that especially this part is like helping people like we have two, over 200,000 cannabis crimes in Germany that are prosecuted every year that we have a response is this part of our corporate social responsibility if you want to put it in a manager word yeah that we are there and we are not only there to open up this market to grab market share but we are also there to give something back Awesome, awesome, thank you, that's amazing. Needy, what do you got? Four tips for uh, new legacy cannabis companies to survive the oncoming market. Yeah, I think uh, number one, educate yourself and use the expensive mistakes other markets have made. I mean, this is like free and everybody should take advantage of it. <laughs> we, we already paid for it, yeah, exactly. Um, invest in compliance. I touched on this earlier. I can't stress, I think we see this all the time with folks that we work with uh, who've come from legacy. There seems to be like either a real resistance or this perspective that it's too expensive. It's the most important thing. It should be foundational to every business. Um, and I'd say embrace innovation and efficiency. Um, I think that we need to hold hands more. The legacy markets and the newer corporate markets need to hold hands because if we're going to build something that we can all be proud of, it's going to happen together. We need the money from the new uh, corporate entities and we need the experience from the legacy market uh, professionals. And that's just, it's, it's that simple. And the last thing is stay true to your roots. Like the one thing that corporate weed is never going to have over legacy is a real story. You have that. It's built in. That authenticity really shines through. I mean, you can look at any brand, you can look at any CPG vertical in the world and ultimately consumership gravitates toward authenticity. And that is something that you have with time and experience, and I think we should be celebrating that as an in industry. So, yeah, those are my four tips. Awesome. Integrity, guys. Integrity. That was really Very good. cool. Very good. Luna, what do you got? Dang, that was good. Um, I didn't prepare anything, but it's just like my, my typical rules. It's, it's, you know, get the job done. So that's the efficiency part. Like, don't get, don't, don't be focused on Instagram. Don't be focused on what the other person's doing. Don't be focused on anything. Hire someone to, you know, to, to, to do compliance so that you can focus on your IP, your day-to-day, -day, your culture, your people. Get the job done. Remember your assignment is to liberate this plant and make this just like coffee or sugar or any other stimulant. Like, we're, that's the mission. You don't, it doesn't matter who you work for. It doesn't matter where 
where you are. It doesn't matter how you talk about it. That's, that's get the job done. The assignment is to legalize and create more access at an affordable rate to this plant and to stop putting people in prison and harming them, right? Then there's um, always, you know, look out for your people. Like, don't step on other people to get where you are. Don't act like you invented a strain or don't act like, you know, don't bite, don't rip off people's IP and, you know, like, look after. The, a lot of people in the cannabis industry where we're from fight internally when really it's us against them. It's, it's our government. It's the, it's the stigma. We, in, a lot of interfighting. So that's another thing, you know, I say is, oh, you know, look out for your mates um, and have fun is a really important thing. Remember why you're doing it. Like, have some levity. You know, there's, there's, it's really important to remember, like, stay centered. Have a story of a why, why you're in cannabis. Be able to tell people with joy and with pride and with honor that you're in this industry. Let them know that you're there for them. And maybe you guys can share a truckload instead of each of you paying for something. You guys go together and coalition build. We call it cooperation, not competition. A rising tide raises all boats. We're all on the same team. And the fourth piece is just cover your ass. Lawyer up. Get your money right and get your lawyers right. Because it doesn't matter what panel you go to, what your friends say, what anyone else says. Unless someone is being paid to follow the laws that change constantly, the goalposts get moved, and you're being asked to play a game where the rules are changing and the stadium changes locations on a daily, weekly basis. You know, I'm sure you're getting some gray hairs. Yes. It's, it's very stressful. So be flexible, be adaptive, and cover your tush because it's people are losing their livelihoods. They're getting arrested. And where I'm from, the cops will come, they'll shoot your dog, they'll take your kids, and they'll take your trucks in your house, and you'll have nothing left, and you have a felony, and you can't vote, or, or you know, in certain states you can't vote, um, and in, in certain places you, you're not able to get a job. So, like, this is this is a, a real war that's happening. This is a civil rights war. So just watch your back. It's not cool everywhere. In Spain, it's very serious. They're arresting people constantly. So just remember where you are and don't get too comfortable because it's not legal yet. Absolutely. And Aaron, what you got? Four, well, four tips. I absolutely agree with everything said here. And following up on what Luna said, definitely invest in a good attorney. And, it, and it's not just, you know, the, being worried about... Um, the police kicking in the door. It's also, you know, make sure you're, you know, you're working with the right people. There's a lot of predators out there. There's a lot of sharks that are trying to come in to the, especially going after legacy operators and trying to strike a deal um, just so that, you know, they can get get wealthy and bounce out of the industry when, you know, really we're here to stay and need to make sure that we have that long-term mindset. Um, and also just, I think the, one of the most important things when I see uh, successful legacy operators, you know, as they, as they enter into the market, they're, you know, don't stay isolated. Connect with other people in the industry. Learn from your, uh, I think you said cooperation, um, and, you know, not to give a shameless plug for, you know, trade associations, but join the trade associations that represent you and give to politicians who support you, uh, show, you know, show up and speak your mind to those who, who maybe don't or are on the fence and be visible. Um, those who kind of hide out and you know, think that they're going to be able to you know, lay low and uh, not be affected by policy changes or regulatory changes or you know, the, the criminal justice system almost always eventually uh, fail. Guys, give it up. This is one of the best in the industry right here, in, right here, man. So we're gonna, we got 10 minutes left. We wanna do some Q&A with some of the brightest minds in the industry. Anybody wanna come up with some questions? Feel free, we'd love to answer them. Any questions? Let's, uh, over here. Hey, Jason Shower, Modern Extractor Podcast. I just wanted to add one thing to uh, what you guys were just saying about the advantages that, or advice for legacy brands entering into the regulated market. Your biggest advantage is the network that you've had having to operate as a legacy brand. So that's that's a huge thing for me. Just wanted to throw that out there. So use those relationships because the uh, the big corporate big bad wolf doesn't have them. That's absolutely right. I mean, having you know the relationships is very important as you bridge that because you can actually share connections and you can share those types of resources. So thank you for adding that. That's that's really really appreciate that. Well, and it's what you do with the Modern Extraction Podcast, right? Because like that's what we're talking about. When we're saying education. Like you're bringing people on to talk about extraction, which is not as like sexy of a topic as like some of these other things. But you're empowering people to be able to do it themselves and teaching a man how to fish for himself. So you're a perfect example of just one person just having a microphone bringing people on, but that's going to be played thousands of times, hopefully more. And that's, you know, that, that's, that's a, you're a great example. Thank you. Next question. Over here. Thank you. 
So it's kind of a comment question. Um, I actually just recently relocated to Europe from the US after having been in the industry for about seven years. Um, and part of what I realized is that most of the topic around legacy market kind of focuses in the US on the illicit market. And I don't feel like there's enough information about working towards medical and honoring the medical system. In the US specifically, we've really gone in the direction of recreational because that's where the money is. What I'm noticing over here in Europe is that that's different. It seems like Lisa has some things to add on that, that the culture is just completely different. And so a lot of these are kind of North American specific problems. There's no war on drugs over in Europe. I mean, there, have, there has there been their own. There is a war on I mean, there has been their own, but I, um, right. yeah, of course. Man, each of us their own, but um, I just think it's going to have a lot more education and testing and, and a lot of the compliance centric that we're really going to benefit from back in the US. And I'm really excited to see what Europe does with that. I think that it's going to be a really good thing from us as well. Lisa, do you want to add on that? Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, definitely, if you think about standards, um, there is no real cannabis standard. So these standards have to be developed. And uh, you ha have a step ahead. But I think like for the, for the European ecosystem, we need to create our own and look at what is happening in other areas, like, for example, for the medicinal cannabis. But especially for recreational, it shouldn't be so strict. But still, there should be a safe product for the consumer. But if uh, you think of the legacy market in Europe, what are these brands that we have here as legacy brands. It's the seed banks, it's the bonks, accessories, um, stoner media, all these kind of things. Those are the legacy brands that we have here. But for the real cannabis producers, there are no brands. This is all illegal. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would agree with her on that. You know, I'd also want you to make sure that you can differentiate between medical and adult use. You know, medical absolutely has a totally different path through science and education and, and really the therapeutic uses of cannabis, which has been done for thousands of years, right? Whereas adult use is more like the lifestyle. Right, so important to understand those differentiators, but thank you for adding that to this and I'm, I'm glad that we can, you know, cover that too as well. Um, next question. Um. A oh. question to the women on the panel. Do you feel that some of the projects you've been talking about are about community and um, do you feel that women in the industry are more com ready to collaborate even right the way up to the CEO level and this is where a lot of the change is happening by the women pushing these good causes whereas the men don't necessarily want to talk about it as much? Uh, Luna? That's, uh, yeah. defi that's definitely <laughs> been my experience. When I, I was, so back when Women Grow first came out in 2015, I was one of the Bay Area chapter heads, and I, oh, I don't, I mean, it's just the willingness and the ability, I don't know if it's just because women are typically codependent, so we just say yes to everything, we give away free consulting all the time, I don't know if it's a bad thing, but it definitely feels like camaraderie and there's something shared with marginalized people. I'm also a, a Jew too, so like, there's this thing about when you meet another Jew, there's just like this love of like, you kind of understand me, and women just know without having to say anything that we have to work extra hard, and our ideas are not always considered valid, and we will say something that a man says, and it'll be ignored until he repeats it, and it's, then it's heralded. So there's these microaggressions, and these small violences every day that wear at your self-confidence, and at your ability to really show up fully, and so when women see that and support each other, it's not that men don't, it's just that there's no way for someone who has a majority culture um, that privilege can ever really understand how hard it is to be. And then once you start adding intersectionality of then sexuality, race, you know, all that stuff, then there's like, you know, you know, black women or queer black women and all those things you have on top of it. So we like to support each other because it just feels like there's already stuff that doesn't have to be said and we just know that we're there for each other in ways that I wouldn't say I've always been welcomed in by men. I, I have to prove myself to men. Women automatically accept me for the most part. I'll, I'll just add to that and say that, you know, I think that part of, you know, what, what we've seen evolve in the, in the market in, in America is this really intense sense of uh, competition, which is really mis misfounded because the reality is, is that there's so much white space even right now in the industry in the U.S. I think this idea of collaboration and cooperation is actually intrinsic to the plant. It's a female plant at the end of the day. We've been using it forever. It's never going to stop whether it's legal or it's illegal or 
whether it's stigmatic or it's not, I think women are really like, you know, we're, we're seeing this in the United States, the amount of secret chats and groups and, you know, it's necessary. It's an incredibly misogynistic industry in the States. I, I can tell you as a woman of color running a brand in California, I've experienced sexual harassment, physical assault. This is a really intense industry to be a part of. Um, but the good news is, is that folks like us, everybody in this room is like awake and that we have these conversations because the opportunity to exponentially grow is like it's boundless. So I think when we when we have these kinds of conversations and Luna and I are looking at each other, you know, rolling our eyes half and also half like so excited because we see the opportunity. We see, you know, I'm always open to collaboration as a brand. I don't view my fellow CEOs of other brands as competitors. I view them as part of the same class. Like we all have the same PTSD, we all have the same adrenal fatigue, we're all getting beaten up at the same rate. So let's hold hands and do it together because at the end of the day the enemies, the real enemies of our industry are tobacco, big pharma, like, let's be real, like, we need to be focused and be aligned and work together. I think it's, it's massive, so. Amen. Awesome. Awesome. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. I would like, I would like to, to thank and uh, congratulate all the speakers. You have been brilliant. I think when it comes to education, it's very hard for us to talk without expressing the need to work with schools and at the university level, because we need to prepare all the health professionals um, uh, on this subject, you know? And uh, it's uh, hard to believe that things are going to change if you don't involve schools and universities and also the biggest organizations, corporations in the world that lead with education like UNICEF, uh, UN and uh, UNESCO, uh, World Bank and all the institutions that, uh, that uh, finance the education around the world. We need to have this subject on the manuals, on the textbooks uh, in schools in different areas, in different degrees. And uh, that's why, for example, I am at this point organizing the, uh, the International Expo on uh, hemp and uh, related with cannabis in Lisbon on June 18 and 19th. We are uh, in Lisbon talking about uh, all these subjects and bringing not only politicians and entrepreneurs and this and that, but also journalists who need a lot this preparation. Schools, universities, June yes. 18 and 19 in Lisbon. Thank you so much. So I think and there's congratulations. Thank you. I think there's two things happening. One, there's a conspiracy uh, because of big pharma that doesn't want people to grow their own, and they also don't want doctors to learn about the endocannabinoid system. So there's like that private interest and that whole thing. But also, until this is not federally illegal in most countries, none of these other banking institutions, everything has to come from decriminalization or um, from descheduling it. In our, it's just, it needs to come down from being a hard drug because none of these people, they all have lawyers. Even like Instagram, their lawyers just read, cannot promote the use or sale of drugs. Promoting the use could just be smoking. They're just, the lawyers of all these things are just reading the laws. So the banks, it's not really up to them. Until we decriminalize, no one's going to get on board to put it in schools. It's just how it is. That's why we, that's why we need lobbying. They're just waiting. I don't even think that there's like a cultural, like, I don't even necessarily think that they're doing that. Sorry, guys. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, just, I just think that we need to remember that if, until we, uh, they're waiting for the green light. I think people are actually gonna be excited. I think, you know, Harvard Medical School, I'm sure wants to teach about the endocannabinoid system. Until, until they feel like they can do it without losing their federal funding, it's a gag rule, it's a literal gag rule. They will not give you federal funding if you teach these things in schools. Right, right. Well guys, this is all the time we have. Thank you guys so much. Give me a round of applause for our, our, our panelists here. Yes, and ICBC too as well. Thank you guys so much. You guys are amazing. Okay.